Excellent. Thank you very much. Again, um, let me introduce myself. My name is Esam Yassin Mohammed. I'm the uh, climate change research leader with the War of Fish, and I'll be moderating today's event. Uh, first of all, let me say welcome, Ben Benu, Marhaban Bikum, and Karibu uh, to all our participants, wherever you may be. Marine and freshwater resources provide millions of impoverished people across the world with livelihoods and provide a range of critical ecosystem services. However, these ecosystems are affected by climate change through gradual warming, ocean acidification, and change in the frequency, intensity, and location of extreme events. The impacts of climate change are primarily felt by vulnerable communities with limited adaptive capacities. Climate variability and extremes are notably a key driver behind the rise in global hunger, leading cause of severe food crises, negatively influencing all aspects of food security, including food availability, access, utilization, and stability. The consequences of continuing action could be catastrophic unless impacts of climate change on aquatic food systems are not reversed. Millions of livelihoods could be lost and numerous communities will have reduced food accessibility for their survival. This virtual discussion hosted by World Fish, CCAFs, ICAT and IMEDO seeks to understand the challenges and opportunities surrounding the transition to climate resilient aquatic food systems by discussing the roles of technical innovations, market systems, development and institutional reforms in building climate resilience of food systems and identifying scalable and sustainable systemic solutions as well. Now, let, let's, let me um, uh, focus on our audience today, just to let us know uh, where you're from, who you work with, et cetera. So we'll run a, 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 a short poll now. That will also sort of give our, our other registrants uh, time to join our today's um, session as well. So um, I will invite my colleague to put on this, uh, to share with you the poll. Okay, shall we close the poll now, Doina? Or... 
Excellent. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, great. Uh, this is fascinating. So, yeah, we have a big number of participants uh, from Asia and the Pacific, followed by Europe and Africa. And uh, really great to see a number of participants from academia and research as well, but also a number of NGOs, government, uh, a number of other uh, stakeholders as well. Um, huge interest in the contributions of sustainable aquatic foods to livelihoods, which is really great. I think that's going to be um, the focus of the discussion for today as well, and a number of other various interests as well. No, that's fantastic. That's really great. And now, without any further ado, let me, we, we're very, very privileged uh, today to have three distinguished panelists who do not need any interaction. We have uh, Bruce Campbell, who is a director of the CGIR research program on climate change, agriculture and food security, or CCAPS in short. Uh, Bruce Campbell has worked extensively in agriculture and forestry research for development. His work has spanned social ecological systems, the link between poverty alleviation and forest goods and services, and Aboriginal natural resource management. Bruce, thank you very much for joining us. And we also have uh, Dr. Salim Ulhaf, who is um, a good friend of mine and a former colleague, and was the director of the International Centre for Climate Change and Development, ECAD. Salim Ulhaf is an expert on the links between climate change and sustainable development, particularly from the perspective of developing countries. His current focus is on the least developed countries' vulnerability to climate change and the impact of adaptation measures. Thank you, Salim, again for joining us. And our third panelist is Edith Rudith Lukanga, who's also a familiar face and name to many of you today, and the founder and executive director of the Environmental Management and Economic Development Organization, IMEDO. It is really Lukanga is a global leader on small-scale fisheries issues with 15 years of experience working in value chain analysis and development. It is really is passionate about women in fisheries and believes that women's rights, gender equality and women empowerment are important pillars for fisheries governance and natural resource management. So thank you so very much for making the time to join us and share your insights with us today. Thank you. First of all, let me start uh, with Bruce. Bruce, I would like to start with you uh, just to set the scene. And um, just if you could tell us, or tell me and the panelists and our audience today uh, about uh, your understanding about how is climate change affecting food systems or in particular aquatic food systems, uh, Bruce. Okay, great. Yeah, um, so it's going to be all encompassing, you know, right from the production end to the consumption end. I would say the production end is the place where it's really going to impact the kinds of stakeholders where we work with us, the small uh, scale producers. So we're going to see um, shifts in fishing stocks and that'll be actually opportunities in some places of the world such as perhaps west africa whereas other places there will be declines like southeast asia uh, inland fisheries lake tanganyika for example estimated 30 percent reduction over the next coming decades and it's not always about the future either it's already impacting through these extreme events much mm. higher severity of extreme events but perhaps one of the most interesting uh, ch changes that are going to come is from the consumption end, actually, where one of the crucial um, needs is changing diets. This is for yeah. in order to mm -hmm. reach a 1.5 degree world. And mm -hmm. shifting away from high, high carbon diets can give opportunities for the fishery sector, but alternative proteins could also impact um, uh, demand in the fishery sector. So as you can see, it's from production right through to consumption that changes are on the horizon and changes that must be made in terms of adaptation and mitigation. 
Yeah, no, that's fantastic, Bruce. Uh, just a, a quick follow-up question to that. I know you're one of the people who also shares my frustration about this very single issues focused approach to tackling the impacts of climate change on food systems. If you were to advise any government or business or others, other stakeholders about the change that we need from a systems thinking point of view, what would that be? Yeah, no, I, I'm super frustrated by the narrowness of approaches. So, you know, for example, uh, person from a certain organization sees the solution in the mission of his organization and yeah. so on and so on and mm -hmm. we've just put out this report actions to transform food systems under climate change where mm -hmm. we see the solutions having to be right from the production side to the consumption side and right from the technology technological side to the institutional and market end of the thing and without mm -hmm. having this holistic vision and really thinking about all the and all the stakeholders that you need to engage for the solutions, mm -hmm. I think we're just not going to be able to achieve what we have to do. No, that's that's a very good point. Uh, point well taken, uh, Bruce. That's a very good point indeed. Yeah. Um, let me also uh, ask our other panelists as well. Of course, uh, Salim uh, and Edith Rudith as well. In terms of you know, uh, from what you've heard um, from. Um, Bruce, in terms of you know, what roles could there be uh, for a systems thinking in the way we tackle climate change uh, uh, through technological innovation, through institutional transformation, through market systems development, through uh, empowerment and inclusion, etc. So maybe, Salim, is it okay if I go to you first? Sure. Thank you very much, Assam, uh, for inviting me and and. Uh, uh, approaching this question. So I would add another dimension to what uh, Bruce just said, which is sort of uh, going from a sectoral to a multi-sectoral approach. I would also say that we need to go from a uh, prevailing paradigm of a very top-down approach to a more bottom-up approach. And my work in climate change is very focused on the most vulnerable communities in the most vulnerable countries. You mentioned mm -hmm. the least developed countries in Asia and Africa. Mm -hmm. And many of these most vulnerable are fishers. They are either open water fishery, uh, fishers in the marine uh, or uh, aquatic or the open water fresh water. Uh, for example, in Bangladesh, we have huge uh, open water fisheries, which you are quite familiar with having worked here on our hills of fisheries. Uh, and then mm -hmm. also small scale aquaculture. So many of these people are completely dependent on the fisheries, either open water capture fishery or uh, aquaculture for their livelihoods. And often they are just treated as recipients of a top-down either policy from policymakers or even technology from technology people. Uh, and I feel that they are missed out in this larger systems thinking. So to me, a systems approach is not just multi-sectoral, which I agree with Bruce, but also a top-down has to meet bottom-up and the bottom-up has to be done much better than it is now. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Salim, if you don't mind me following up on that question. So yeah. what's, what's, what's stopping, what's hindering that? You know, as you rightly said, that sort of you know, with the bottom up and the top down where they have to meet. And uh, uh, what's, what's stopping that? What's stopping us from doing that? What's hindering that now? I think what's hindering it is a very strong mindset that people like you and me have that we think we know the answers. And we <laughs> don't have to listen to the poor fishermen telling us what's happening on the ground and telling us, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> we have to be able to listen. We have to be able to work with them and not tell mm -hmm. them what to do. Right now, governments, you know, bureaucrats and, and the policymakers tell people what they have to do. And then technocrats mm -hmm. and experts like you and I do the same. Uh, and we need to be open-minded and we need to be better at listening than we have been. Indeed. Indeed, Salim. No, I 100% agree with you on that. I think we need to be able to listen um, and promote that bottom up sort of, you know, flow of information in our um, decision making process as well. So, no, that's that's a very good point, uh, Salim. Uh, maybe uh, I think if we have anyone who spends most of their time working with um, small scale producers, uh, particularly in Africa, is uh, Edith Rudith Lukanga, who's with us here. Um, Edith Rudith, can you tell us how small scale producers, particularly women, are um, two things. Uh, one is how are I mean how are the 
impacts of climate change impacting them from all those multiple dimensions, the multiple systemic constraints in the in, in market systems, in be it in finance and uh, and access to technology and information, etc. How is that impacting uh, those small scale producers on the ground and but also, I would also like to ask you if there are any success stories that you can share with us as well, uh, it's really Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Isam, and thank you for this opportunity for allowing me to share um, my experiences working on the ground with officials and with all the value chain workers. So to, uh, to answer this question, I think I'll look at uh, the impacts of climate change that are affecting officials and fish workers. And I'm going to give um, practical examples based on what I'm seeing on the ground and based on my work experience uh, where I come from. So for example, one of the main um, impact affecting fishers and fish workers, impact of climate change, is the unpredicted, uh, unpredicted weather pattern. And uh, that comes in through uh, increased or unpredictable rainfall. And this leads to an increase in post-harvest loss. And when this happens, who is affected? Who, the one that are affected the most are the value chain actors that are involved in the processing. And when you talk of the processing, these are mostly women. They lose a high proportion of their products because of um, he heavy rainfall uh, or too much rain or sometimes because of flooding. So for example, where I come from in the Victoria, we have women who do um, rely on this small pelagic fish, locally known as daga, for their livelihoods. And mm -hmm. they rely on nature, I would say, you know, local processing, depending on sun uh, to, to process, to dry. And normally daga mm -hmm. is not just for the women, but all the value mm -hmm. chain actors uh, in the daga fishery they depend on uh, natural sun to dry because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mostly this daga is exported when it's dried. So there is a massive loss of livelihood because even with the recent rainfall that ha just happened, it flooded mm -hmm. the, 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 the landing sites. It flooded in a way that n no daga was uh, was able to be spread because the drying with the limited technology still we are witnessing um, drying on, on while spreading on the land but also mm -hmm. even if they were drying them on the rocks but still with the rocks and in the open air system how would you resist the rain so these are mm -hmm. just some of the impacts that are happening so what can mm -hmm. change what what needs to to, to change uh, so that to improve the situation. The first thing that I'm looking at is um, technology. And when um, I say technology, I'm not looking at the high, high tech, but look at the simple technologies that are mm. accessible, that are affordable to the vulnerable mm. communities, to the um, poor value chain actors mm. that are more uh, responsive to the climate. So enhancing climate mm. adaptive capacities by creating an enabling environment. And um, mm. this will, will, will help to improve the handling and processing systems that um, mm. will, um, at the end of the day, we withstand uh, the, the, the extreme weather events. Yeah, yeah. so also um, what needs to change, I'm looking at um, finance. Because even mm. when we are needing the technology, how could we have a, a an advanced technology or even the simple technology that I'm, I'm speaking about without having access to finance. So it is important that in order to navigate, in order to transform, we need to, uh, to, to, to develop an environment whereby there is, that would ensure sufficient mm -hmm. finance is made available and uh, to, mm -hmm. to, to, the, to, to the value chain actors. And therefore, mm -hmm. it will enable them to transit within this climate resilient um, aquatic food system. But also, Thanks. I'm looking at uh, market, market services. We have products, right. you know, we have, you know, technology has helped us to, to, to process. We have our product. Mm -hmm. 
but how do we reach the market? This is another thing yeah. which is also very important, and Absolutely. it needs, you know, it needs, um, you know, investments to be done in order to have an environment whereby small scale food producers and the value chain workers access the market at the right time with their products mm -hmm. while still in good condition. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking also at um, access to information and this is particularly mm -hmm. um, climate information services should be improved. Mm -hmm. You know, information mm -hmm. about weather. When the fishers mm -hmm. go down to fishing without knowing whether it's going to rain or not, that's also mm -hmm. challenging because if they come back even if yeah. they manage to, to fish and they come mm -hmm. back with fish, uh, as example, this small pelagic that I'm referring to, yeah. and it rains, you know, mm -hmm. how, how, how will that happen? I mean, again, it will add on to the, to the, to the loss of the, of the, of mm -hmm. the product because at the end yeah. of the day, no one will be able to buy, you know, the, the fish. Mm -hmm. And even if they buy, it will end up to waste because of the poor technology. So all yeah. these are interlinked, are interconnected. Absolutely. So Absolutely. partnership is important so that all mm. the, value small, uh, the value chain actors, the small scale food producers, the government, mm. the NGOs, the mm. donor you know, uh, communities yeah. should work together. I, I liked yeah. um, uh, Salim mentioned of the multi-stakeholder processes you know, and engagement. Mm. This is key. It's very important mm -hmm. that even the researchers, the scientists, listen to what the small scale food producers, to what the value chain actors are saying. What are mm -hmm. their questions? What are their demands? What are their needs? So that these um, uh, programs are designed in a way mm -hmm. that they will respond to those questions, to those needs, yeah. to those demands. But lastly yes. is the empowerment. <laughs> and this is what yeah. I've been really preaching and I've been saying whenever I get an opportunity, empowerment yeah. and capacity enhancement of the value chain actors, especially mm -hmm. the vulnerable communities yeah. with limited adaptive capacities, particularly yeah. women, youth, and mm -hmm. poor men. So it right. is important for all these uh, you know, elements that I've mentioned. And that's why mm -hmm. we are looking at um, systemic approach you know, yeah. not looking at one or singling out elements within that system, yeah. looking at it as a, 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 a holistic approach. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, so, uh, if, yeah. we, if I may interrupt you there, I think that you've made okay. an excellent set of points there. Uh, it is true this, and I, I'm sure this is where I see the value as well, sort of bringing us sort of those uh, practical examples in terms of the multiple challenges, systemic challenges that these small scale producers, operating food producers face, uh, be it from access to market, access to finance, access to technology, uh, information and uh, uh, capacity and power, etc. I think that's what exactly we're talking about. I have a question, maybe a follow up question, maybe back to Bruce, which is related to this one is, uh, because Bruce, you mentioned about, you know, to address all these points that uh, it's really has been talking about, we need a systems thinking, a systems approach that you know that looks at all these multiple systemic challenges together. However, Bruce, the reality is, line ministries operate within their own mandate. Other stakeholders operate within their mandate, and therefore there's this this traditional disconnect, um, rigidly defined structure that does not enable that. How do you disrupt that in reality? And this is a question related to uh, a question that was raised by David Marion. From one of our participants uh, today. So how do you disrupt that uh, rigidness in, in, in this kind of uh, approach uh, and to shift towards more systems approach groups? I know yeah. it might be a bit challenging but uh, I'm sure you'll deal yeah. with it. No, it's sure challenging. So let, let me just, uh, they also raised issues around research. So let me just look at it in the research sphere first of all. Okay. Perhaps Salim okay. can take it to the broader sphere. So yeah. I would say that the program that we've run has disrupted the CGIR. <laughs> okay. in, in that okay. we, are, we are aimed at, our, so this is the climate change program, we are aimed mm. at outcomes, first of all, and the mm. outcomes must bring the specific partners to the table. And okay. within the CGIR, that means different centers because they've all got different expertise. Mm. So, 
and then because we've aimed at outcomes and actually our budgeting is performance-based budgeting, we do not, we do not hand out money and, and just mm. get research for whom it may concern. Mm. We look at outcomes on an annual basis, peer yeah. review, just like journal papers, and mm. the performers get budgets to continue. Mm. If you're going to get an outcome, you have to do the kinds of things that Salim is talking about. Work with the mm. farmers, understand exactly what the needs are. Work with mm. the line ministries, and there may be different mm. ones, to pull yeah. them together in a team to achieve the outcome. So I would say, yeah. you know, for, for me, that is a radically different way of working than an institutional mm. model of working. And I yeah. think for climate change writ large, beyond the research, we have mm. to have seriously ambitious targets and we have to put the teams of different players together to make it happen mm. from the bottom up to the top as well. I think it's yeah. so crucial, as Salim says, to work at all different levels. Precisely. Precisely. No, thank you very much. And I think that sort of nicely leads to my next question that's directed to Salim as well. As many of you know, Salim, I think, has attended every single UNFCCC <laughs> COP. Is that correct, Salim? Correct. Correct. <laughs> handful, exactly. One of the and, handful uh, of people. <laughs> exactly. Who's never given up. And, you know, and I think Salim has been very, very instrumental in uh, amplifying the voice of the least developed countries in that process as well. And uh, I've benefited a lot by working very closely with you as well, Salim. And uh, I guess maybe, as Bruce was saying, this needs to be, uh, you know, addressed at multiple levels, you know, the bottom level to all the way up there. And at a global level processes, such as the NFC um, uh, uh, COPs, uh, how is this very well understood? A is very fundamental question. How is the impact of climate change on, on food systems in general, but aquatic food systems understood? B, is there any hope that this kind of you know, systems approach could be employed at the global level uh, debates and discussions as well, Salim? A very good question, uh, Assam. So let me start with the UNFCCC, which you mentioned, the Climate Change Treaty. Uh, that has been very difficult over the years to recognize uh, food systems in general, agriculture, mm. fisheries. Um, you know, everybody who works in this sector has had a hard time finding their niche in, yeah. uh, in the UNFCC. Um, yeah. In the last couple of years, we have achieved that. So, you know, mm. agriculture and food is now a recognized domain. And so people who work in this sector can participate in the UNFCC process, bring their skill sets there, and bring mm. decisions out of the UNFCC that are relevant. But I would also point to a parallel system, which I think is more well-developed, which are the mm. 17 uh, sustainable development goals. The yeah. SDGs are also meant to have a cross-cutting uh, uh, um, modality. They're not single mm. uh, ministry or single uh, uh, groups uh, uh, relevant. Mm. And I'll cite the example of the prime minister of my country, Bangladesh, uh, uh, Sheikh Hasina, who is very committed to the SDG. She's one of the high level champions of uh, SDG six on water. And mm -hmm. what she has done since the SDGs were first adopted globally in Bangladesh, she has mandated every ministry to look at mm -hmm. the different SDGs and identify mm -hmm. where they are relevant. And for every mm -hmm. SDG, there is one ministry that's coordinating, but there are at least four mm -hmm. or five others that have to contribute. And, the, yeah. and she set up a very high level monitoring division mm. in her own office, in the prime minister's office, to drive yeah. this process of cross ministerial, because everybody works in silos. You know, they don't talk to each yeah. other most of the time. She forces yeah. them to do that. And so to me, yeah. that's a good thing. And they are now gradually beginning to understand how to do that, make it more effective. Mm. It's part of their business plan. They have to annually report on what have you done mm. to contribute to multiple SDGs, not just the one yeah. relevant to you. And so that to me is a very important uh, way forward that I, I find hopeful. And, and the last point I'd like to share with you is that uh, the United Nations is now uh, going to have next year, probably in October, but the date has not been set, a, a, uh, an, a, a global food system summit, which mm -hmm. will try to bring together all of these. 
and there are various right. action tracks on that summit, one of which is mm -hmm. on resilience, which I have been asked to uh, 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 chair a, a group of trying to bring people together on that. And so yeah. I, I would uh, invite you and all, everybody on this uh, panel as well as it, attending uh, to by all means get in touch. We will do consultations. So my, my input to that, I told them is I work with civil society actors. I, I am a bottom up person. I will uh, do my best to make sure that voices from the relevant uh, sectors, people, both aquatic as well as uh, uh, terrestrial, uh, get in, fed into it. And uh, there mm -hmm. will be a series of consultations taking place. I'd be very happy to yeah. cooperate with everybody on this call uh, to ensure that uh, voices get into that uh, uh, global uh, farming systems approach. So intellectually, they're trying to get a systems approach. In practice, yeah. how to do it, uh, you know, we still have to Remain figure out. Remain challenge. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, a common challenge that's uh, shared across uh, many stakeholders and hence why we decided to make that the focus of this discussion today. And thank you very much, Salim, for that invitation uh, for everyone in the room today to contribute uh, to this uh, high level uh, food summit next year and the work that you do there as well. That's fantastic. No, that's, that's, that's really uh, great. Um, I was just going to um, maybe sort of, you know, parachute ourselves a bit down to the ground now and uh, go back to um, uh, Idris Rudy, uh, I'm sorry I interrupted you earlier, but I was very keen to, I'm very, very keen to hear from you uh, a slightly uplifting story from the ground in terms of particularly, you know, if you, you work with uh, particularly women stakeholders across aquatic food supply chains, uh, particularly in Tanzania and elsewhere, Idris Rudy, how are these women how have, have they been very innovative? I'm sure they are. And uh, can you tell us any uplifting story in terms of you know, their innovative approach, how they've been managed to grapple with all these different systemic challenges that you mentioned and how are they trying to overcome that? I think we, I personally, have, there is more hope on the ground than uh, this high level process. I don't know, it is really Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for this. And um, I'm going to share practical examples, for example, uh, from Tanzania, where I come from. Um, yes, women have done a lot, have been innovative, but that has not been enough if they, 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 they are working in isolation. Hmm. So um, coming back to the multi-stakeholders approach, these women, hmm. um, uh, together with uh, EMEDO, the organization that I work with. Uh, mm. We have worked together with the ministry responsible for fisheries in Tanzania, that is the Ministry of Livestock and Fisheries, but also other um, actors um, like FAO, who have worked to support the women to come together. And that's why mm. the question of organizing and capacity empowerment is very important. So mm. right now, as I speak, the women mm -hmm. fish processors and traders in Tanzania have come together. They have formed a national network of women uh, fish workers mm -hmm. that is called TAUFA. And why did they come together? And this network was lo just launched recently, last year in April. They've come together to unify their mm -hmm. voices, to see because they are vulnerable. And mm -hmm. they, although they are continually gaining grounds into decision making, but that has not been enough yet. Mm. So they want to even raise their voices higher to shout mm. out that yes, we who are the vulnerables, we who are yeah. much more affected by the impact of not just climate change, we are here yeah. and we, we, we have knowledge, we have skills, we have something to contribute. And yeah. like what Salim was saying, listening to, to for, for the decision makers to listen to these women is, is, is really practical, is really important. So this coming together has helped the women to participate and engage in national level processes. Mm -hmm. They also access information easily mm -hmm. than before because now they have even an address. If they are to be invited, mm -hmm. they have their own national leadership. So this is mm -hmm. one, but also uh, influencing uh, mm. policy-making processes. Like recently mm. in Tanzania, 
uh, the ministry was leading a process where they are reviewing mm. the Fisheries mm. Act. And women, mm. for the very first time in Tanzanian history, they came together through this national network to mm. share their views on what do they want to see captured mm. in, the, in such regulatory framework. So mm -hmm. this is really important and they are the framework that we are seeing, women influencing policies, yeah. influencing strategies, and et cetera. And another Thanks. example at the continental level, uh, yeah. similarly, we have uh, our fish net African women fish processors and traders yeah. network yeah. that also engages with the African Union on similar mm. grounds. Yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. I think that was a much needed uh, uplifting story. It is really, um, and I'm glad you shared those uh, 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 stories with us. Uh, great. Uh, if I go back to Bruce for a moment now, Bruce, um, here is my understanding. I understand that the impacts of climate change, yes, I think we may be able to mitigate them to some degree. But also, as my friend Salim says, you know, some of the damage has been done and it's irreversible. So therefore, the only option we have is to adapt. And the consequence of not acting now, I think time is not, it's, time is just certainly we're working against a very tight sort of, you know, timeline here. And there is a desperate need to transform our approach and accelerate change, right? And to be able to mitigate any further damage and to be able to adapt to the current irreversible you know, damage that has been done already. And, uh, and therefore, the question is with respect to investment or finance, is there sufficient investment being made to accelerate that transformation to climate resilient aquatic food systems, Bruce? Uh, by nowhere is there anywhere near enough finance in terms of right. the needs. I mean, if you think about the small scale producers in the world, this is all of them, you know, livestock keepers, crop land, mm. uh, fishers, there's half a billion yeah. And the, these are the most vulnerable people to climate change. Mm -hmm. And essentially, if we believe in the SDGs, zero hunger by right. 2030 and, and the various yeah. other SDGs, yeah. we have to reach 500 million farmers yeah. in the next decade. Yeah. That is a task that has never been achieved before at that kind of scale mm -hmm. and, and speed. Yeah. And, and this is why we need radical thinking i think in terms of achieving those targets yeah. the amount of you know if i can hold up my hands here the amount of development funding is a finger yeah. and we need that much right and so so one of the key things as well is how do you leverage in the private sector so we, uh -huh. we must we must see small scale producers as one way out of poverty is really to be able to get involved in markets mm. and you know the estimates are is that there's more than enough finance out there looking for opportunities and so how do we use government money development for money to leverage in 10 to 20 times more private sector investment because that's mm. the scale of investment that is needed to solve the problem and yeah. I think there are nice examples where that's that's happening, but Thanks. it's it, it seriously needs to be scaled up. And and you know yeah. it's not just a case of the finance and the development group working. How is it yeah. going to happen? And enabling conditions for business for small scale producers to get involved in markets. So it's a a big government lift as well. That government yeah. has to get its act together in terms of creating great business opportunities and the enabling conditions for these yeah. small scale producers, the fishers and the aquaculturalists. Excellent. No, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce. Uh, maybe if I, t I follow on that uh, interject interjection there, uh, Bruce, and uh, invite Salim. Salim, I know uh, you've spent so much time talking about finance, uh, particularly be the GCF or through other means and um, how do we make sure money goes to where it matters or how do we make sure 
those who need it most have access to finance to transform uh, their adaptive capacity. Salim, do you, do, you, do you want to share your insights around that in terms of the equity dimension and who needs it most and what could be more effective as well? Yes, thank you, Assam. And, and building up on what Bruce just said and agreeing with him, uh, you know, the amount available compared to the scale of the requirement is minuscule. But even mm. the amount that is being made available is not being spent well. So just let me tell you about the climate change finance mm. uh, that is available globally. Uh, the developed yeah. countries have promised $100 billion a year from this year yeah. to tackle climate change. Yeah. I'm not sure. Nobody knows how much of that is actually going to be delivered uh, within the year. Yeah. But let's say maybe a half to two thirds might be. If you look yeah. at what is being delivered, then mm. the vast majority of that is going to support mitigation actions, reducing greenhouse yeah. gas emissions, which is a good thing, but it yeah. does not help the poor people on the ground to develop, to adapt to the impacts of climate change. So only 20% is going globally to support adaptation. Now, if you look at that 20% that is supposed to go to adaptation and you look at, is it reaching the most vulnerable? Then, you know, our colleagues in IID, where both you and I used to work, have actually tried to uh, uh, trace where the money has gone. And they can only find 10% of 20%. That's 2% of the global amount that is actually reaching the most vulnerable. And in, me, in my mind, that is absolutely the wrong uh, proportion. And so what mm -hmm. we need to do is to prioritize those most vulnerable. As Bruce said, ha half a billion people are the most vulnerable people on the planet, fishers, farmers, livestock attenders. They need to be prioritized from the bot, from the top down, and they haven't been. They, they, they've been so in name, but not in practice. So how do we make that happen? It's a challenge for both sides. Those of us working on the ground have to be more effective, have to be able yeah. to articulate our demands better. And those that are making these decisions need to understand the need to do this and agree that this is something they, they should do. Just last yeah. one point to, to make here. Sure. Um, you may be aware that there's been over the last couple of years, a big global commission on adaptation chaired by Mr. Yeah. Ban Ki-moon, former secretary mm -hmm. general with Bill Gates and Kristalina Georgieva and lots of very high powered commissioners. They came out with yeah. a report last year. They're going to do a big a global adaptation summit in January on the 25th of January. Um, yeah. Those are all good things and they are moving yeah. things in the right direction, but they right. haven't moved them yet. So we need to be, right. you know, making them deliver on their promises. They're promising. Yeah. They agree with what I'm saying, but they don't yeah. do what they need to do. Let us make them do that. Yeah. And let us collectively, yeah. you know, join forces to ensure that they do that. We, we yeah. don't have to argue with them anymore. They're not telling yeah. us that we are, what we are saying is wrong. They're saying, yeah. show us how to do it. So let us show yeah. them how to do it. Thank you. Excellent. I think that's very clear and crisp. Um, no, that's very, very clear. Um, no, that's, that's brilliant. Um, I, I, what I'm going to do now is um, I have a very important uh, uh, question uh, It's going to follow now to make it very timely as well. But meanwhile, if I can remind our participants to quickly post your questions on the chat box and then I will take that, those questions uh, uh, back to the panelists. But as, as you write your questions, I have one question, uh, particularly for all our panelists. Now, we are in a, we are in, in a period where we're facing a, a double crisis now. We have the climate or ecological crisis, but also we have the pandemic at the moment. If there is anything that gives me sleepless nights, I ask myself, has the COVID-19 pandemic undone some of the progress that was made over the last few decades or so? Do you share my concern? And if you do, what would, how, how do you think it may be impacting the progress that needs to be made or that has already been made in adapting to climate change? Who wants to go first? I'll have a go if you want. Please. So it, it, this is, you know, gives me sleepless nights as well. And uh, mm. I, I had the opportunity last night, late night, my time, uh, to be invited to join a, a, a discussion on the British Sky News television channel. They had a, a panel discussion about this very question. Mm. 
you know, COVID or climate, which, which one yeah. needs to be prioritized. And I said, you know, there's no choice. You have to do COVID and you have to do climate. Mm -hmm. so why are you making this a binary choice? It isn't. You need mm -hmm. to do both. And to me, yeah. the biggest challenge or biggest opportunity, in fact, coming out of the COVID crisis is the fact that leaders of countries who were willing to listen to their scientists, in this case, epidemiologists and medical scientists, about what needed to be done, what the problem was, mm. what needed to be done. And leaders mm. who moved quickly to do them saved lives. Mm. And leaders who refused to listen to their scientists, and you know, we are looking at one of them in the United States of America, is responsible for thousands, tens of thousands of their citizens dying from COVID-19 because they refused to listen to the science. And that lesson mm -hmm. is orders of magnitude more important when it comes to tackling climate change. The scientists have been telling world leaders what to do. World leaders have been sort of dragging their feet and saying, yeah, but it's very mm. difficult and it takes time and we can't really allocate resources. When they have to, they do. And so they have to treat mm. climate as emergency and crisis, which unfortunately we haven't been able to persuade them to do. And to me, this challenge, we need to be yeah. looking at making it an opportunity to change from the old bad ways mm to a new, better normal, hopefully. People are talking about Build Back Better, but we need to make that a reality if we can going forward. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Salim, for sharing insight. Can I invite maybe Edith Trudith on that and then Bruce? Yeah, thank you, Isam. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. this. And I think, yes, uh, COVID-19 um, is accessibility the multiple uh, challenges that are already there caused by climate change and many other uh, challenges. And um, I would like to speak from um, experiences on the ground with the women mm -hmm. uh, fish processors and traders that I work with. Um, because of COVID-19, um, that has interrupted the business chain. It has interrupted the whole value chain, I would say. And locally mm -hmm. here, women, no matter how small you know, the, the, the business that they do, but it mm -hmm. is very significant for their livelihoods for their economies, for their health, mm. for their education, for everything. But because of uh, COVID-19, um, that has cut, had cut off and it has cut off the connection between them and their buyers. Yeah. And, they, yeah, and uh, that has uh, impacted them badly because um, mm. they've lost their livelihood. They've lost mm. uh, uh, money to... to that they would use for, for, for their, you know, domestic, you know, uses for health, for education, for everything. But mm. also that is at the local scale. We have women who, and, and other value chain actors who have been um, doing a regional business within East Africa and within the Great Lakes region. The closure mm. of borders really did them bad because they had already invested a lot, but how are they going to transit to send their business mm. to the other countries that yeah. locked, they were locked? So it has mm. really uh, impacted, and um, we need to treat all these things together, uh, climate change impacts and the impacts associated with COVID-19. They should be looked at together because they all are impacting people, and we have to learn on how to live with them both. Now that you are discussing on how, um, how we, we could deal with the issues around um, uh, climate change impacts, such as finance, also with the COVID-19, how are we supporting the value chain actors, the women who have lost their capitals uh, because of um, COVID-19? So mm. it's really important and it's really a challenge that needs uh, deliberate efforts, need in yeah. investment in order to yeah. rescue the situation. Sure. Thank you very much, Edith Ruiz. Uh, maybe just before, uh, sorry, Bruce, I'm sure you've been thinking about responding to this question, but I I'm going to paraphrase it a bit, still related to COVID-19, uh, because I want to relate it to one of the questions that was asked by one of our uh, uh, audience today, members of the audience today, is that, uh, the investment in climate change adaptation maybe amounts to a few dozen billions a year, but this is, seems to be completely dwarfed by 
the amount of money in trillions that's being uh, you know spent by governments what does that say about the attitude that we have as a global community when it comes to climate change are we not maybe could it mean that we're not seeing it as a terribly serious uh, uh, existential threat or why the lack of investment if we're able to invest this much to respond to the impacts of climate to COVID-19 in such a short period of time what's missing from the um, the climate change discourse yeah no no, no it, it, it goes a bit back to the points that Salim was also made making about yeah. how you can't make binary choices around these things and there's there's been these mm. analysis where the amount of money raised mm. is is incredible and you know could we have not done that for climate change as well yeah so so it, it does mean that the threats are you know people see them as further in the future than than mm. the COVID crisis for example i was just yeah. also thinking about the you know yeah. has this put us back I, I think mm. it's it's more an, an, just like uh, Salim was saying a general lesson rather is mm. this is this COVID crisis there's going to yeah. be more our globally connected what? world is going to mm. this is this kind of thing is going to happen again and again right when what happens when we have uh, synchronous droughts in all the major bread baskets of the world mm. and mm. the price of uh, commodities rockets up that will be another yeah. cri serious crisis. So okay. I think I think the le for me the lesson is around resilience, the crucial nature mm. of building resilience, both for climate yeah. change, but for other mm. things. And it, 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 you mentioned climate information services and how we need to get mm. them to farmers. And yes. I think one can broaden that. How do we get trusting systems that? Mm small scale producers can use for all different things to build their resilience. And mm. I, I've see, I, I did see a nice example where in Ghana, there was a system for agricultural advisories on digital mm. reaching, mm. they reach a, like a million farmers and they started mm. using it for getting COVID related messages out. And so you can see that when, and perhaps it goes back to that lesson of cross sectoral as well, how mm. health, water, agriculture, if you really think about these things, you can build resilience of mm. local populations. Indeed, indeed, yeah. No, I think that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, there are there are uh, quite a number of uh, questions um, that are um, coming directed at uh, a number of uh, uh, yeah to all of you the panelists here. Um, we have a, a question here from Ian Cox here, uh, who's asking, has anybody looked at the adaptation strategies of these vulnerable communities during previous extreme events? Did they adapt their livelihoods, portfolio, shifted fishing patterns, etc.? There are so many lessons that we have not learned from the past that could support future initiatives. And the reaction to that. Well, let me take a, this take is a your, crack your area. Yes, okay. Yeah. So the, uh, the short answer is yes, but the longer mm -hmm. answer is more nuanced in that um, what do we do with those lessons mm -hmm. and how do we make them uh, useful going forward? And whereas yeah. I, I would say, you know, in the past, we used to see mm -hmm. these under what I would call a paradigm of development, you know, poor yeah. people helping them develop, enhance their capacities and, and knowledge and, and ways of doing things. What mm. climate change has, has done already and is doing mm. even more and increasingly with every passing day is making the risk to those most vulnerable people even more than they used to have before. And so yeah. under those heightened risk conditions, it makes... Yeah learning and doing even more difficult. And that really is mm. the challenge of adaptation uh, for us. And yeah. the one of the uh, ways to think about this is a mm. multidimensional sort of time wise. In the short term, we need to be thinking about how to help them. In the longer term, we need to be enabling them to be able to transform 
out of wherever they are at the moment. And uh, mm. as Edith Ruth has rightly said, I, I believe so as mm. well, capacitating, providing them and their children with the next generation to be able mm. to be uh, better prepared, mm. better able to cope they may or may not stay in the profession of their parents mm. as farmers or fishers, yeah. but they will have the ability uh, to do better than mm. they just coping. So we need to, the paradigm shift is from managing risk to transforming yeah. out of being risky. And that's a big, yeah. big thing for all countries and particularly the most vulnerable countries as countries with their own vulnerable populations to start yeah. thinking about. And to me, a, a big, uh, focus should be generational change. We don't want yeah. our children to be suffering like we are. We want our kids, girls and boys to be empowered yeah. and capable of making our entire country transformational. And, and we're talking about 10 to 20 years to make this happen. And that's the trajectory that we all need to be focusing our attention on. Excellent. Okay. Uh, I'm going to pick another question from the member of the audience as well, is that uh, the, we talked about the accelerating um, the adoption of systems approach to, to accelerate transform transformation in terms of, you know, uh, building a climate resilient uh, food systems, which is desperately needed now. But this does not happen in a vacuum. You need uh, policy framework and institutional frameworks that enable that as well. So how do we tackle that? What sort of policy reforms are desperately needed to enable that transformation? Because we, without talking about markets, technologies, climate information services, access to finance, etc., all these, these things do not happen in a vacuum. So what sort of institutional setup is desperately needed? What sort of change is needed? I think that's a very important question, I thought. And uh, maybe Bruce, if I come to you. It's very context specific and depending on the place, but uh, yeah. you know, so we've got, uh, you know, we think about transforming food systems and we've got six things that we think mm. are absolutely crucial. And one of them mm. is, um, is enabling conditions and yeah. huge responsibility for government in terms of making it happen. Mm. And uh, we've seen some places where it works well and other places yeah. where there's extremely little progress in those places where there's extremely little progress it is not po I, I do not believe it's possible to transform the food system right and it's almost a case that those those locations are going to have to receive more or less humanitarian assistance mm unless unless the enabling conditions really change so mm. for example you know i talked about leveraging fine private finance in private mm. finance won't come when the business operating environment is is mm. not satisfactory um, i'm a zimbabwean and mm. you know the challenges of seeing change in zimbabwe at the moment are really severe mm. I, I cannot see we can have a transformative approach in Zimbabwe because the enabling mm -hmm. conditions are just not right. But then there's some great positive examples as well, you know. So, for example, yeah. uh, it's not a fisheries example, but Rwanda really mm -hmm. creating conditions for uh, private sector to come in. There's a, a Africa improved foods. They've put up new factories, they're sourcing, they've got an aim of sourcing from small scale producers and they're mostly women. Um, they're producing nutritious crops, which then go into government feeding programs. So mm. it's how do you put that whole package together and government is a key player in it. But, you know, very, it's very context specific of what has to happen absolutely. in different places. No, absolutely, you're absolutely right. Uh, and hopefully there could be an opportunity sort of uh, for, you know, uh, transferring lessons or, you know, learning lessons from uh, different contexts, as you rightly said, uh, Bruce. Yeah, uh, I have one question from the member of the public again, um, because there was so much emphasis about this bottom up approach. Uh, maybe I think I'll, I will put uh, this question to Edith Ruiz and maybe followed by Salim as well, is 
there's so much emphasis on bottom-up approach about engaging small-scale producers um, and in gathering information uh, to um, develop, you know, adaptation and mitigation strategies, etc. But however, the the question is, how is this pandemic affecting you, your ability to reach uh, those producers and small-scale producers and to be able to listen to them and uh, go and talk to them, etc. How are you tackling that uh, uh, hurdle, if you like? Uh, it is true, yeah. Yes. yeah. Do you want to? Yeah, th yeah, I, I want to answer that. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, uh, on the other hand, we can say uh, the pandemic, apart from being uh, really a pandemic, is also an opportunity mm -hmm. because right. um, with what, how I work with the women, with the food producers, uh, the use of um, ICT, information communication technology, has mm -hmm. been a challenge. But now we have been forced, you know. And yeah. uh, for example, with the African women fish processors and traders, uh, this year we are planning to have um, a strategic planning workshop. And this was going to be a face-to-face -face workshop together with mm -hmm. leadership training and everything. But mm -hmm. and it was going to happen in March. But because mm -hmm. of uh, COVID-19, everything was canceled. So we kept on right. grappling with it. How are we going to do that? And mm -hmm. um, some of uh, the members don't have, you know, smartphones and everything. But then we came up with a solution. We are doing our meetings um, through WhatsApp. We have created WhatsApp groups. We communicate, mm -hmm. we send messages. And recently, uh, with the mm -hmm. support of uh, uh, our donors, we got each member of the bureau, the leadership, uh, a, a gadget so that we are able to make, uh, to, to do our meetings through uh, Zoom facilities, for example, the online mm -hmm. facilities. So yeah. it is creating this opportunity so that we are able to, to move with this pace, you know? So yes, Absolutely. it has been a challenge, but we are transforming. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yeah. this is good, yeah. Excellent. No, thank you very much. It is. And Salim, I'm sure we've had a chat about that in the past, but you know, if you can share it with the wider audience today, that'd be really great. Yeah. Sure. So uh, building on what Edith Ruth just said, you know, in mm. Bangladesh now, we have practically 100% of mobile phone coverage. Everybody has mm. a mobile phone. Right. And the number of smartphones is increasing very, very rapidly as well. And so... Mm. Uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, lockdowns, uh, inability to travel and move around, the yeah. entire country has moved into a Zoom world. You know, I'm in yeah. Zoom meetings morning till evening with different people, uh, not just around the world, but inside Bangladesh as well. Yeah. And actually, yeah. that's a benefit because I don't have to spend hours in Dhaka's tra really bad traffic to go to a meeting. Right. I can just have a Zoom call with people and everybody's so, now adapted to it very, very well. Right. You know, we have leaped from right. into this virtual modality of communicating very well. Yeah. And I think this yeah. will be a continuous benefit, even in a post COVID world, when we can start meeting physically, mm -hmm. we don't need to always meet physically. It helps. I'm, I, it's yeah. definitely an impediment not to be able to do so, uh, but it yeah. isn't as big an impediment as we might have thought before without this technology availability for us. Sure, indeed, indeed. No, thank you very much, uh, Celine. That's a, that's a very good uh, point. Yeah, there are so many uh, questions that are uh, coming in. Yeah, um, I guess maybe one thing that we haven't really talked much about, um, sorry to, uh, but it's so important to me, very close to my heart, is the issue of youth who are the future. I'm not sure if I'm at the age bracket where I can call youth anymore. So, but I think the, the youth, the, the employment opportunities for youth, particularly with the, with the advent of climate change in our aquatic food systems, how we may be disrupting um, our uh, food supply chain, et cetera. And what should the key priority be? I think this, I mean, but I, when, I, when you answer to that question, I will give that opportunity to all of you. When you answer that question, please do think about the systems, the, all the systemic challenges that we've been talking about and what needs to change from a point of view of access to information, technology, market, finance, and of course, power 
uh, and the policy reform, etc. From all these dimensions, if we focus on our subjects, the youth now for the next few minutes, what should we do to catalyze change that benefits the youth in particular? Bruce? Well, I'm going to leave it to the others, but I, what I would like to say is that one of our 11 things that we believe are needed in terms of transformation is engaging with social movements. And some right. of the most Im important social movements around climate change have actually been these youth student movements. They have done okay. more for climate change than any of my reports yeah. <laughs> or Salim's <Yeah>. reports <laughs> right. uh, or your True. reports. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. you know, and so I think bringing youth into our into our expert groups and those sorts of things is so crucial. They've got yeah. great ideas and they mobilize, they into social media. So I'm, I'm talking about that part, but I let the others mm -hmm. talk about there's also this need for employment issues at the, at the producer level. I'll pass on to the others. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Bruce, uh, who would like to go next? Shall I, shall I go next, Assam? So let please, me pick up please, from Bruce, and yeah. I agree sure. entirely. Sure. So let, let me rephrase the issue from my perspective. Okay. Um, in, I work mostly in least developed countries. They're both vulnerable to climate change at the same time, very poor yeah. uh, populations. But we have a huge asset. That's our yeah. young people, all right? Our young people are as bright and capable as anybody around the world if yeah. we invest in them right. So the investment that we are making at the moment, in my view, is not the right kind yeah. of investment. We are investing in making them into laborers and workers. We need to be investing in them to make them into entrepreneurs and in skill sets that they can then be leaders and not just yeah. followers. And yeah. you know, this is very dear to my heart because I'm a professor in a university. I, yeah. I have students who are the best and the brightest uh, in University Indeed. Bangladesh has more than 100 yeah. universities. Every least developed country has multiple universities. But if you look at the sort of global top-down, you know, capacity building uh, efforts, uh, quote unquote, it's always international consultants flying in, doing workshops and flying out. We call that, you mm -hmm. know, fly in, fly out, uh, consulting expertise, capacity building, doesn't leave anything behind. And whereas we have mm -hmm. universities who can be invested in to build the capacity of the next generation for that transformational uh, transition that we need. And to me, I would say that's the number one area yeah. where we can reinvest what we have. We don't need any extra money. We just need to yeah. be using the money we do have better yeah. than we have used it so far. And that means yeah. a paradigm shift in thinking and in doing things very, very differently. And that's really my passion at the moment, as you can hear. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, Salim. And can I invite it's Ruth maybe to share her insights on this as well? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I think picking up from uh, what Salim has said on um, investment and investing on youth, I want to look at the research and uh, asking why aren't youth part of these processes? And I think uh, looking at the food systems perspective, there is a need for um, some kind of a research that would respond to such kind of questions as to why anti youth uh, involved as they should be, but also capturing their perspectives, you know, capturing their views, capturing their needs, responding to their questions. And this, again, as I said, would be used to, 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 to design interventions that. Uh, would attract youth into the food systems um, interventions. So I think, again, um, in engaging youth into um, the design, uh, that, yeah. that, 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 that is the, 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 the research, food system research to respond to the needs of the youth. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you yeah, very if much. If I may add, if I may add, like uh, the, I, the use of ICT, information communication technology, that's where yeah. youth are, are, are really based. And um, with, when you look at the aquaculture food systems and value chains, you'll see there are a lot of youth these days coming in into aquaculture. And why is it so? Because um, the, the, we are continually seeing some improvements on the enabling environment that attract youth, mm -hmm. for example, in Tanzania here as well. So we need to 
see more of what is it that interests the youth. And that's why I'm calling for uh, food systems um, research to respond to these questions that youth have that will bring them on board and it will yeah. also re respond to the question of a lack of employment, you know, yeah. when youth will be able to be employed along the value chains, along the food systems value chain. Excellent. No, thank you very much indeed, Elizabeth, uh, Salim and Bruce. It's been extremely insightful. Uh, if we have the, the time, I may ask one more question from the audience, but uh, meanwhile, I would like us to take a quick poll with the pad with the member of uh, uh, the the audience, um, Doina, if you don't mind putting up the yeah. So, uh, in your view, which of the following critical areas of the systems approach should be uh, prioritized in achieving climate resilient and inclusive aquatic food systems? Again, um, having discussed all these different issues, of course, the answer might be all of the above. But you know, if you were. <laughs> but, but you know, at a gunpoint, if you were forced to choose one, please, you know, if you can identify. Maybe we'll give it under 30 seconds or so, uh, and we'll see the quick results. Right. Maybe that's enough time, Doina, and we can quickly have a look at the response if that's possible. Okay. So yes, I think um, yeah, I think there's roughly sort of equal weight almost given to all, uh, but uh, obviously increased investment seems to. Uh, have received more votes, uh, so increased investment and um, technological innovation, uh, sustainable finance, and market services. Uh, I, I think this is a clear uh, manifestation that you know they are all equally important, and therefore I think next time we'll add one more answer, which is all of the above, and uh, we'll see pretty much 100%. Uh, <laughs> I would say. Uh, great. Uh, so maybe just before uh, I, I think our panels have one final question, maybe to Bruce, uh, a very, very important question that was raised by a number of the uh, participants today is that the question with respect to the approach followed by donor agencies. So uh, normally the way donors work is uh, to be fair and to be honest, I think it's primarily sort of single issue focus most of the time looking at in either empowerment or policy reform or market systems or finance, but it's hardly anything that integrates all these different um, aspects that we've been talking about. So what would you message be, uh, Bruce, to that? What would you message be to the um, donor agencies or development partners in terms of the shift that's much needed to enable such change to happen? Mm -hmm. No, no, I mean, it's absolutely crucial that there's much more synergies happening amongst donor agencies. And, you know, bizarrely enough for the CGIR, there is quite a lot of work amongst them because they actually come together as a single funding group. And so there's yeah. one environment where it kind of more or less works. And, but when you, you know, when, when you then go to a particular country, you see everybody mm. falling over each other or not mm. working synergistically. I mean, there has been, there have been attempts. There's the forum for rural development, the donor forum for rural development, for example. So there right. are attempts, but you can also yeah. see the challenges, you know, and I, I'm sure yeah. Salim has seen this when putting together these events where you're mm. bringing different funding agencies together. They've all have to speak back to their, their constituency and therefore they want yeah. to do X and Y and the other yeah. donor wants to do Z. And therefore, you know, you can understand why it happens as well. But, you know, we would just plead, can it not be done better? Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Bruce. Maybe sort of quick, quick interjection from Salim in the truth, maybe sort of uh, 30, 40 seconds each uh, in response to the same question before I thank you all. So very quickly, Assam, uh, the domain yeah. of the donors that I particularly engage with is the climate change funding agencies like the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund, and various yeah. others. And my continuous argument to them is exactly this. You need to be focusing on the ground. You need to not be waving the flag and I think trying to you know, brand what you're doing, but look at what the outcomes are on the ground and be uh, willing to work with everybody else without having to fly your flag on yeah. every little thing that you do. That is simply counterproductive in my view for uh, donors. Some of them get it, some of them don't. It's a struggle. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Salim. Edith Rudy, maybe very briefly as well, your quick reaction to that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, quickly along the same lines, uh, the donors should, I would say, learn to have bigger ears and a small mouth in a way that <laughs> the conditions, you know, the, the, right. the, um, <laughs> the funding that they bring to the, to the ground shouldn't have a lot of, you know, conditions. They listen to the people and the grant that is being sub uh, sent should support the needs of the people, not their own conditions. So these um, grants that come with a tail, I would say no. And uh, I think uh, it, 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 it will be more practical to have, you know, uh, the, the, the funding work for the people and not just meet, uh, meeting the demands of the donors. Sure. Thank you very much. I think we've had very excellent responses to all the questions that were raised today. Thank you so very much, Editor Lukanga, Bruce Campbell, and Salim Mulhat for joining our uh, panel discussion today. Uh, just to conclude, I will invite uh, Dr. Gareth um, Johnston, who is the Director General of World Fish, uh, to give uh, his final closing remarks. Gareth. Thank you, Sam, and uh, hi, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. A really stimulating discussion, and it's a shame that we have to close it. I think it could have gone on a bit longer, uh, for sure, but uh, we covered a lot of issues. And um, yeah, I'd like to thank, thank all the panelists and, and also the audience um, for this really lively discussion. Actually, it's really inspiring to see such a variety of, of international participants uh, and also the folks from different around, around the world join this dialogue. You know, I'm a, I'm a really, really big believer in networks and coalitions. And so in these diverse networks of skills and expertise, uh, we can really build climate resilient aquatic food systems and put them on a, on a low emission pathway. So I feel very positive about the, the movements and the networks that we can create. And as, I've, as emphasized today, aquatic foods are critical to the economy the food, nutrition, security of billions of people around the world. You know, climate change poses complex threats, as we've been hearing, to those who depend on marine and freshwater food systems. As Bruce was mentioning at the beginning, increased temperatures are causing fish stocks to move to cooler waters, offering you know, costs and benefits to that movement. Harsher climates are putting pressure on aquatic production systems. And as Edie Truth was talking about, these extreme weather events and disasters and so on are causing disruption to fish supply chains. So what we've, we know is that fishers and fish farmers in low income countries will really feel the impact of climate change and are feeling the impact uh, of climate change and will be hit the hardest. Shocks caused by the climate change threaten people's livelihoods that we've been discussing, the ability and the quality of the aquatic foods imposed increasing risks to health and safety. As we've talked about the COVID-19 pandemic, it demonstrates that food systems as they're currently constructed aren't coping with these shocks, causing inequalities in food affordability and accessibility. And really COVID-19, this is a wake up call. Some people have described it as the, as the fire drill. So many other similar disruptions that will occur as climate change influences our world in very different and unpredictable ways. And we really need to build a climate resilient food system transformation. And we need to do that now. It's, it's more, more and more obvious that that needs to happen and more and more urgent. Aquatic food systems are also complex and they involve, as we've been hearing today, many different actors from different networks, all of them interacting in different ways. Um, and the responses and impacts of climate change can only really, as a result of these complexities, 
complexities be truly understood with an integrated systems approach. And this requires a shift from the targeting of, of uh, research efforts from, from sort of single issues to more holistic approaches. I think Bruce was talking about the way that CCAS have been working, has been looking at more programmatic approaches across commodities, and then taking into account technologies, markets, the political changes that, that we need to uh, incorporate and to achieve the impacts at scale. It's complex and it requires multidisciplinary actions that build the adaptive capacity in order that we can provide adequate and sustainable aquaculture uh, and fisheries in the supply of aquatic foods. Back to coalitions, partnerships are really at the heart of this work, interdisciplinary research partnerships and platforms very much like this virtual dialogue that bring people together are essential to bring different stakeholders together. So we have researchers, dialoguing with politicians, with community representatives, with civil society groups and the private sector are all needed as part of this catalyst for transformation. And, these, and with such partnerships and with such coalitions, it's important and to generate knowledge and data. You know, data is going to be a really incredibly important aspect of understanding climate risk, particularly transnational risks. And you know, digitalization of that data is also very important in order to get uh, knowledge and be able to investigate properly these global processes, including the impact of trade, investments. Uh, we touched on a little bit about local power relationships and structures to support the adaptations and, if possible, mitigation actions and approaches. Such partnerships are all essential in the rollout of innovations that will build and continue to build resilience towards, towards these risks. Strong data, really important, supported by stakeholder engagement and the importance to advocate the inclusion of aquatic food systems within national climate, food and development policies, often forgotten. And as discussed um, by the panelists, systems approaches must make sure that suitable and accessible technology innovations, such as, and was discussed previously, climate advisory services are available to all aquatic food producers. Building local capacities to use scientific information and data for innovation is absolutely crucial. Small scale producers and value chain workers must have access to markets as well as access to, and I think um, Essen, you're raising this, important in finance, including insurance, social protection schemes, our institutions and policies, and particularly fisheries management tools must be reformed to respond to the impacts of climate change. While our public and private sector um, uh, partners need to ensure the equitable flow of finance for climate resilient investments. What does that mean? It includes looking at carbon credits, looking at blue bonds, looking at blended financing, bringing public and private minds together and finances. So we must build evidence on how local power structures can inform policy and investment interventions that lead to what we might call equitable outcomes. And equity really can help if we have that as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a really important development objective uh, interventions to build resilience in communities and it's a very essential for adaptive capacity. So we look at our global food systems, you know, the, the numbers are high. We're looking at about 40% of all our greenhouse gas emissions coming through our current global food system. So I, I really advocate we must mainstream uh, aquatic foods in order to reduce our overall food systems contribution to climate change. Our research shows um, that sustainable aquatic food systems produce much less carbon emissions than many land-based crops and livestock. So we can integrate, do trade-offs, look at uh, aspects of plants growing in water where temperatures are often very high or salinity uh, uh, inhibits normal crops from growing to produce protein without having to convert land to agriculture and providing therefore opportunities for stabilizing environmental impacts. As I mentioned, often climatic foods are overlooked, and not even invested in, uh, and it's important that aquatic foods presents us with protein and micronutrients that we need to tackle climate change and protect biodiversity 
and bo boost human nutrition. So no surprise, I'm a big advocate for aquatic foods and aquatic food systems, particularly in responding to COVID-19. We've got to take this opportunity. Uh, we're not going to eat it, just talking about it. We've got to walk the walk, grab this opportunity to build forward better and contribute to the sustainable development agenda. Resilient and inclusive aquatic foods have a critical important role to play in, title, uh, in tackling climate change. And, and, and going back to the group today, the participants, the international cross multidisciplinary uh, representatives here of networks, advocating and, and helping to harness these systems approaches to build climate smart aquatic food systems, really important. And it's through these systems approaches that we can identify, we can co-create with, with many of the fishers building up from the ground up and implement evidence-based solutions, innovations that we need for a healthy people and a, and a healthy planet. So as Director General of World Fish, I know how important strong partnerships and coalitions and networks are to research and to making these impacts. And I, and I encourage you, um, when this webinar is finished, do get in contact, do share ideas, inputs for, the, for, for collaborative, collaborative action. And thank you, Esam, and thank you everybody who's behind the scenes supporting this webinar, the whole communications team. Thank you again for taking the time, everybody, for joining and to further this discussion. So back to you, Esam, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gareth. Uh, thank you very much for those very inspiring uh, final remarks. Um, uh, you've nicely sort of brought it all together, uh, the points that we discussed today. I, I think uh, my initial thought when we started the discussion was, this is something that makes sense only in theory, but not possible in practice. But I think my confidence level is much higher now uh, following this discussion that this is something that can be very practical, that can happen on the ground. Yes, it's not easy, it's very challenging, but as Gareth was saying, if we all come together, work together through partnerships and networks, and that's something that we should all aspire to achieve. And um, Let's, uh, you know, uh, understand the complexity, the interactions uh, as we uh, tackle the impact of climate change on aquatic food systems. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll, I look forward to the opportunity to work in partnership with you all in driving that agenda forward as well. Uh, finally, let me thank usually uh, uh, our panelists, you know, uh, Bruce Campbell from CCAV, Ruth Lukanga from Imedo, and Salim Haq from ECAD, and all the fantastic team uh, um, from our communications team in particular who made this possible, and all our panel participants for taking the time out to join and enrich today's uh, discussion as well. With that, uh, wish you all the best. Stay safe and healthy. And until next time, take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.